All right, one more time. So Hades recently released on PlayStation and Xbox consoles, and if you're anything like us, you've been playing it constantly, despite already having an extensive save file languishing on your Nintendo Switch or PC. But like I've said before, Hades is just that good. Now, perhaps you've gotten a few successful runs under your belt thanks to our beginner's tips video or just your own perseverance. Maybe you've bossed certain elements of the game but are curious about what else it has to offer. Or you're a little confused about one obscure mechanic or which boons really are right for you. Well, fear not. Having played hundreds of hours, we have come up with some advanced tips to hopefully see you through. Because look, if I am going to hell, I'm dragging all of you down with me. You're welcome. Now, this might be an obvious one to begin with, but it makes sense when starting a new run to choose the infernal arm that has the darkness bonus, which is indicated by a purple glow around it. You'll eventually unlock a gems bonus to add to this as well from the house contractor, making it a doubly rewarding choice. The weapon offering this bonus will change every time you return to the House of Hades. And it's randomized, so it is worth doing, if only because it encourages you to continually stay sharp with all of the infernal arms instead of just relying on a favourite and trying to repeat the same build every time you play. They do say that variety is the spice of life, even in the afterlife. After your initial leveling up phase in Hades, your priority in collectible items will shift. Keys, for example, won't be as crucial to your development as they once were after all your weapons are unlocked and the Mirror of the Night is more or less fully upgraded. If you're missing a particular item or just have lots of darkness and keys to spend and don't know what to do with them, Trading with the wretched broker in the lounge is a great way of getting rid of the things you don't want in exchange for the things that you do. Every five keys, for example, you'll be able to obtain a nectar, which is a much more valuable item as at one point your attention turns to leveling up Zagreus's relationship with all of the Olympian gods. That will take a lot of nectar, so five keys per bottle starts to sound like a pretty good deal. Plus, after every run, the broker will always have a one-time offer at his kiosk that can be more costly, but well worth the investment. It's always recommended to at least check in on them in the lounge before moving on through to your next escape attempt. Need more of those, so here. Let's see that nectar. Once you start getting into the swing of completing runs, you'll quickly start to rack up Titan blood particularly if you've been disciplined about saving up your obol and spending it on the more expensive offerings in the Temple of Sticks. Once Titan Blood starts to accumulate, make sure you're actually spending it on upgrading your Infernal Arms, either to level up your current aspects or to unlock new ones. I mean, you might find that you're doing just fine without, but the difficulty will continue to ramp up as you add different conditions to your Pact of Punishment. And small upgrades here and there will make your life so much easier in the long run. And some of the weapon's alternate aspects really do make a difference to how you play and they open up so many possibilities for new boon and ability combinations, which keeps the game fresh on your 100th run and beyond. Who's ready for the real afterlife experience? Your weapon's hidden aspects will slowly reveal themselves to you over time as well, provided that you're putting the work in to talking to everyone around you and deepening your relationships when you get the chance. The hidden aspects are generally a little more difficult to use, but there are rewards up for grabs from your faded list just by making it to the surface with the weapon equipped. You don't actually have to beat Hades to claim them. I never had any respect for Stygius that blade you bear. Still on the Infernal Arms, it is important to keep up the practice with all of them, because they all handle very differently and complement different gods, depending on the way you want to approach a particular run. 
The Heart Seeking Bow and the Adamant Rail are both ideal for standing back and plugging enemies with long range attacks, while the Stygian Blade and the Twin Fists of Malfon are better suited for getting up close and personal with high damage in close quarters combat. The Shield of Chaos and the Eternal Spear kind of offer a bit of both worlds. They can be upgraded or switched for a different aspect to favor one type of combat over the other, and so they might take a little bit more getting used to to wield effectively. Each weapon's special attack is unique and a big factor to consider when you're planning on how your build will work. AoE attacks like the Stygian Blade's Nova Smash can be great at crowd control, and thus may pair well with Poseidon's tidal attacks that cause pushback damage to enemies. Likewise, the Chaos Shield's throw can be ideal for inflicting status effects like Doom or Hangover on multiple enemies from a safe distance and whittling down their health that way. And it can be upgraded to strike more enemies in a single special attack too. The Twin Fists are great to pair with boons and abilities that do stack damage because you can dash in and out with a flurry of fast punches, finishing with a special uppercut. Mind you, all of this is great, but all of the Infernal Arms attacks can be completely changed via the Daedalus Hammers during runs. And it is always well worth picking this up for the base damage increase that it'll grant you anyway. Not all of the changes the hammers grant you will be your style, however. So if there's a risky upgrade that you feel won't suit you, but you want to mark it off your faded list, maybe save choosing it for a run that you aren't really committed to completing anyway. Take my strength and strike the darkness down. Now, if you're wondering whether there are boons or upgrades that you should always take if offered, I mean, not really. The fun of the game is how versatile it is. But at the same time, you will rarely regret picking up extra dashes from Hermes or dash deflect from Athena. I mean, basically, dash should be your default way of moving around in Hades. ABD, always be dashing. It just makes you harder to hit. And when paired with deflect, it means that you're dishing damage right back to enemies simply by moving around. Even when these boons are common rather than rare, epic, or heroic, they're usually a significant boost, particularly if you're struggling with your current damage output or you're just feeling a bit squishy. Although it was quite some time ago, the girl poof, just vanished. Generally speaking, it's beneficial to stick to one or two gods on a run rather than borrowing a bit of power from everyone. You see, boons tend to build in power depending on what you already have equipped, and new offerings will generally tend to complement what abilities you've previously got. So it's better to invest in one or two gods and greatly increase your chances of being offered higher tier boons rather than going for a mishmash of abilities that you might like, but that don't necessarily mesh well together. Had to do it. There is a time and a place for your different keepsakes, and to get the most out of all of them, you should know when to equip and use each of them. So Tartarus is for the Chthonic coin purse. You keep this money even when the purse is later unequipped, or for a keepsake that you're looking to level up. In Asphodel, it's wise to pick up the boon of the god that you're planning on strengthening your build around, and continuing that in Elysium unless you need a bit of a defense or a damage boost. Then, in the final section of your run, the Temple of Sticks, the Evergreen Acorn, or the Broken Spear Point will see you well prepared for Hades himself. Now, there are two keepsakes that are a little bit different, however. The Pierced Butterfly from Than adds to your damage output every time you clear a room without taking damage. And there's a trophy up for grabs for reaching 30% extra damage in a single run. As you can probably imagine, though, this is a significant challenge. So it's best to equip it early in Tartarus to give yourself a slightly easier time. Hermes's Lambent Plume keepsake does a similar job, and it also offers a trophy. It adds to Zagreus's overall movement speed and dodge chance every time you clear a room quickly. While it's equipped, you can see a circular timer at the bottom left-hand corner beneath the keepsake icon. Now, this shows you how long you have to clear the room to earn the bonus. And getting a 20% bonus chance earns you the trophy. So there's really no need to do these two extra challenges if you don't want to, of course, but if you're looking for ways to keep your runs fresh, this is a pretty good place to start. 
Faded authority rerolls can be really handy when you're hoping for a spot of better luck with chambers, but you should know what to look for so as to use them effectively. There are different types of item pools, noted by the laurels around the chamber door pictures. So you'll see that gems, darkness, nectar and keys have blue laurels around them, whereas boons, palms, hammers, hearts and oval have gold laurels around them. The best way to remember this is that blue chambers are things that you keep after you die, but everything you find in the gold laurel rooms is reset at the end of a run. So essentially, when you use a faded authority, you cannot re-roll a blue chamber into a gold one and vice versa. Blue chambers, therefore, probably aren't worth re-rolling unless there's something that you really need to finish a quest. Some gems to unlock a final item at the contractor, for instance. But it probably is worth re-rolling one god for another that you're basing your build around. Maybe though, don't get greedy and re-roll a door more than once, because you might need that other faded authority later on. Might as well. Embrace chaos. Yes, that blood price on entry is steep, and some of the boons they offer are risky as anything, but they do generally pay off, particularly if you visit chaos as early in your run as possible. Fortune favors the bold, and it helps spice things up a little too. Keep track of where you are though. You probably don't want to face off against a boss with a chaos debuff active. And finally, play for you, not for anyone else. So yeah, a lot of guides say don't spend your money until later stages, but if you think an item is going to help you, buy it. Take the chance. The obol won't be worth anything if you don't make it through because you didn't spend 60 measly gold and buy that extra health item after all. And yeah, there are loads of rankings out there for the best keepsakes and the best boons, but if your experience is different, great. Similarly, if you want to turn god mode on, do it. You can toggle it on and off at any time, even in the middle of battle. And it's not going to affect your achievements, progression, or your story. Look, if you're frustrated and not having fun, you're more likely to turn off the game and not come back. And then you really won't learn anything more about the world or find out what else the story has to offer. So just relax and enjoy. So how are you enjoying Hades? Are there any other little bits that you're stuck at, or are you just enjoying the journey? Let us know. And also, answer me this. If you were to add a god to the game, who would it be? And what powers would they offer? I've been asking myself this for ages, so honestly, I'm just curious. Click on one of the videos on screen now if you're interested in more from Eurogamer, and thanks for watching. Bye! Bye. I shall see you back at home. What?